This video is a summary of the ways you draw in an IGCSE physics exam. It will cover spectrum of questions from motion to waves to light waves and will also cover how to do some of, some of the graphs. So let's start with the first question. If you don't know any of the lessons, I suggest that you go back to the channel and uh, look through the lessons first. Now the first question says that a bus travels from one stop to the next. The journey has three distinct parts. Stated in order they are uniform acceleration for 8 seconds, uniform speed for 12 seconds, and then non-uniform deceleration for 5 seconds. Figure 1.1 shows only the deceleration of the bus. On figure 1.1, complete the graph to show the first two parts of the journey. So the last one is shown over here. Now let's look at our scale first. This, should, this is 5, 10, so this should be 15, and we have 20. So this is 25. The last part is shown which is from 20 to 25 there was a decrease in speed now before that it was constant acceleration so i'm going to draw a line from this point for eight seconds but let's able the eight seconds first this is nine this is eight so from here it was accelerating constant acceleration uniform acceleration and then at this point it was traveling at constant speed and then non-uniform deceleration. So let's draw, take a line, uh, different colors, use colors, and then another line from the starting point to that point. And that's how you answer this question. So next, we'll go to uh, vector forces. So let's look at this question. It says that figure 3.1 shows the top of a flagpole. The flagpole is held vertical by two ropes. Those are the two ropes. The first of these ropes has a tension of 100 newtons at an angle of 60 degrees to the flagpole. The other rope has a tension T as shown. The resultant force is down the pole. So the resultant force actually of these two is down the pole with a magnitude and the magnitude is given to 100 newtons. In the space below using a scale of 1 centimeter to 20 newtons, we need to draw a scale diagram to find the value of tension T so in this example, they gave us the resultant, but they want the value of T. Clearly label the 100 Newton, 200 Newton, and T in your drawing. All right. So let's just understand the question. Here we have this force. We have this tension. Of course, the normal way would be to uh, draw the parallelogram. So we extend this. This is also T parallel to each other. And this thing is also the uh, 100 Newton. But of course, so in here, they are not drawn to scale. And the resultant of those two is... 200 newtons but this is not up to scale that's why it's not vertical so now we are going to do it up to scale and see what's happening this is 100 newtons so it should be 5 centimeters based on this scale this is 200 newtons so it should be 10 centimeters based on this scale so let's start with the 200 newtons since it's vertical it's easy to draw we'll get our ruler place it in a vertical position we can compare it in here so yeah this looks vertical but let me get the 10 centimeter mark uh, yeah, the 10 centimeter mark is aligned with the dots behind, so this is exactly vertical. We draw the line, I'm going to draw lines with the black color up to 10 centimeters. Yes, exactly. So this is the first one. And then at an angle of 60, we need to draw 100 newtons, so 5 centimeters. From the tools, we get the protractor, we adjust it. This is our starting point. And from this side, we go 60 degrees. So this is 60 degrees. And then we take our ruler. We know we need to draw a line of 5 centimeters. So I'm going to line it at the 5 centimeter mark. So this is the 5 centimeter mark. We'll make sure it's exactly on. All right, now we can get rid of the protractor and we draw the line. We label. This was the 100 newtons. This was the 200 newtons connecting between them, between a line, and that should be our tension T. Of course, we could have drawn the completion of it. We could have drawn uh, the T over here and then the 100 newton, but it's not really necessary. We already have our result. This was our starting point. This is the end point. So we take our ruler, take measurements. Yeah, this is 8.7 centimeters. So 8.7 centimeters, multiply that by 20. And you should get 174 newtons. All right. Now let's go to another example that involves waves. Sound from a loudspeaker is traveling in air towards a solid wall. 
Figure 7.1 shows compressions of the incident sound wave and the direction of travel of the wave. As it strikes the wall, the sound reflects. Complete Figure 7.1 to show the positions of three compressions of the reflected sound wave. Okay, so this is a reflection example. We have the direction of wave, we have the wave fronts, and we need to show for the wave fronts. Now the easiest is to first uh, draw the direction of wave, continue it until it strikes the wall. So for this I'm going to use the yellow line, extending it till it reaches the wall. Let me adjust from here, it has to follow the same path. Okay, I'll extend it from here just to make sure. Okay. And then at the point where it strikes the wall, we need to draw a normal line. So let me just get the uh, protractor to make sure the angle is 90 degrees at this point I'm going to rotate it and at 90 degrees we draw a normal line now the normal line should be a dotted line so any dotted line I'm going to represent with let's say with green so this is this would be our dotted lines so from here we are going to draw a line exactly on the 90 mark that's our normal and as you can see the angle of incidence is 10 20 30 we count from here so that's 30 degrees, which means after another 30 degrees, from this point, another 30 degrees, let me take this and label, which will become at the 60. That would be the new direction of travel of the wave. That's the reflected wave. All right, we don't need the protractor anymore. Make sure you label the directions. This is the old direction and this is the new direction. Now, we are going to draw the new wave fronts. This is the direction of the wave, but we didn't draw the uh, wave fronts yet. And to do that, we need the protractor again. The new waves, after the wave fronts hit the wall, the new waves must be perpendicular to the new direction of travel. So let's see how would that look like. Place this thing over here, and from this side, we are going to draw from here the first reflected wave. And we do the same from another point from here. So I'm going to draw another one. The same also for the last one. Make sure this is on it. The line over here is exactly with the normal. And then we'll just draw. And yeah, this looks about right. So those are the three reflected wave. Notice how the wavelength remained constant. Okay, so we'll go to another example. Let's look at how to draw circular wave fronts. This is for water waves. You have a source generating circular wave fronts. It hits the barrier. Now the first thing you need to do is find out the uh, image position of the source behind the barrier. So we are going to do that. Uh, we need our ruler. Make sure it's exactly vertical. Now from the center of the point source, you can see from here to here it's 3.5 centimeters. So another 3.5 will reach 7. And at that point we are going to draw a point. Now that would be the image. Alright, so we don't need the ruler anymore. Yeah, we'll take the uh, compass. We take which color, let's make it blue color since they are water waves. Now, when you position the compass, first of all, you need to decide the radius, and it's basically the same as this one. So, let us let us see. I'm going to do the reflection of this wave. This wave, so we're going to adjust until we reach the radius of that wave. Let's move it. To be exactly the same and yes this is the same radius and then we place it at that point and we draw the first reflected wave okay now of course we didn't have to draw the rest let me let me do this again to be better start from here up to this point and that's enough now definitely the first wave did not reflect because it didn't reach the wall the second wave also didn't reflect because still they didn't reach the wall. The third one just reached the barrier but it didn't reflect yet. The fourth one, this part has already been reflected. Now similarly we are going to draw for the other part. We'll connect it to this point from the point source we have and the barrier. Now in this example we need to deal with water waves refraction. This is the direction of the wave travel, the wave fronts, and we need to refract them. And this is going from deep water to shallow water. And we know deep water, water waves are faster than in shallow water. So which means the refraction should be towards the surface. We'll take a ruler to help us. 
So if this is straight, we know the wave that we are going to draw will be positioned towards the surface. From here, draw the first refracted wave. Similarly, from this point, as you notice, the wavelength decreases. That's what happens when waves go from fast to shallow medium. And that's basically it. Now, so if this was the old direction, this is the new direction. You know, the direction must be perpendicular to the wave front. Okay, so let's look at another question. Now this time, we are going to do diffraction. Those are the waves that are going to diffract after they pass through the barrier. You can compare the size of the gap with the size of the wavelength. So as you can see, the wavelength in this case is 1.5 centimeters, but the gap is also about 1.5. So they are about the same. So this is what we are going to do. We place a dot at the center of the uh, last coming towards the barrier. And then we take the compass, we measure the wavelength, the first wavelength, we make sure the radius is the same as the wavelength. This is slowly, and this is the first wavelength. So we draw the first diffracted wave. You can erase the parts later or be careful when you draw from the start. Next thing, you will increase the radius till you get double the wavelength. Then when you select the pen, this is where you select to draw. And then we increase the wavelength triple draw again one more time uh, three are enough but just do the four now this is maximum diffraction since the uh, wavelength is about the same size as the gap you can raise those excess parts and that's the diffraction all right let's go to the other question this time we'll deal with light reflection now it says over here a lamp in a large room is suspended below a horizontal mirror that is fixed at the to the ceiling. Figure 8.1 shows a scale diagram of the lamp and the mirror. So this is what you see. We need to draw two rays from the center of the lamp that strikes the mirror and then we use those rays to locate the image. This is the center of the lamp and we are going to draw two light rays and those light rays could be in any direction. It doesn't really matter this ray or the same point another ray from here or another ray. So as long as they strike the surface of the mirror, doesn't really matter. Here I've drawn three, I'll, I'll select just two of them. Now from here, first thing, definitely you need a normal compass. Make sure it's, yeah, so 90 degrees. Now any normal line, I'm going to select this color. Make sure you draw it as dotted. And yeah, that's about perpendicular. This was the incident ray, and we know it's going to reflect with the same angle. So whatever this angle was, 10. 15, 16, 17, then it should reflect 10, 15, 16, 17. And we'll draw the reflected ray. All right. So this was the first one, label the direction. Same goes for the other ray. So the angle of incidence in this case is 10, 20, 30, 31, 32. So it's between 31 and 32. So I'm going to do the same. This is counting. I'm going to count 10, 20, 30, 1, and this is between 31 and 32. So I'm going to select a line, draw it to that point. Make sure you label the directions. So we didn't draw the normal. Yeah, do that. So two incident rays, two reflected rays. When we extend the reflected rays, now for the extensions, it should also be dotted, but I don't have dotted in the options. I'll just use the green color. So from here, we extend the ray. Make sure it's an extension of it. Another extension. Let me just check. And yeah, this is the extension. Place it then over here. Same goes for this ray. Let me just place it here to check the extensions. And this is about it. This is the point of intersection. And this is the reflection of the starting point. So then, that's where the image of the lamp is. Now in the next question, I'm going to also show you reflection, but without using angles. An easy way to solving it without using the uh, protractor at all. So how to do that? First thing, you find the image, and you can find the image by knowing the distance. You take the ruler. Now, from here to the first surface of the mirror, this is 3.9. Uh, 3.9 times 2, that becomes 7.8. So at the 7.8 mark, I'm going to place a dot. This is our image label it as I. And then from this point, we do the reverse. We start by drawing the extension line. And then from the extension line, we draw the reflected. So this is the reflected ray. Make sure it's exactly on this ray. And this is our first reflection. The same point exactly from the same point to here. 
drawing the extension line and then from the extension line you draw the reflected and that's it make sure you label the directions this is the old direction this is the new direction now we can then draw the normal it's like we are doing everything in reverse and we do the same for here you can also label the angles so this is the incident angle for one of them you label one of them as x okay so this is x the incident angle and that's how you do the reflection question on the next question we deal with light refraction figure 7.1 shows a ray of monochromatic red light in air incident on a glass block at an angle of incidence 50 so as you can see without measuring the angles use a ruler to draw the approximate path of the ray all right so from this point we know it's not going to move straight it's not going to bend away from the normal it will bend towards the normal up to this point okay it doesn't matter you don't have to know the angle we know it's close to the uh, normal but not exactly on the normal just a bit away from it as long as it's in between the old path this is the old path and the normal so somewhere in here should be fine this was actually for red so it would have been better if we chose that color now of course the thing about it is that it's going to be parallel after it emerges from the glass block to this incident ray so i'm going to draw it on top of it then i'll just move it why should those rays be parallel well because this is a rectangular prism those sides this side is parallel to this side so therefore well, if the incident angle is 50 the emerging angle should also be 50 degrees we don't know the angles in between because we didn't calculate but definitely the emerging angle should be 50 and don't forget of course to label the direction of travel and then the other part use a ruler to draw the approximate path of violet ray in the glass block so definitely violet is going to refract more we choose the violet color so definitely it will refract more in here but when it exits it entered with an angle of 50 same as red so it should exit with also an angle of 50 same thing they are not spreading further after they leave the glass block they are parallel to each other if it was a triangular prism then they would have spread further and dispersion would occur at this time we are using triangular prism so this is our red ray and we know when it exits it's going it's not going to go straight it will refract even further so this is the let's say the refraction of red draw the direction and we also need to draw for violet so same thing violet when it enters it refracts more than red and even after it exits it refracts even more that's why they disperse and why does it refract more well due to the geometry of the shape don't forget to label the directions all right next thing now this time we need to do refraction and find the position of the image formed by refraction so let's start by drawing the refracted rays we can start by drawing the normal first normal and another one and then the refracted we have options either to go straight uh, towards the normal or away from the normal now the option is of course away from the normal because uh, it's going from water to air from high density medium to low density medium so this is the new direction and same thing goes over here they shouldn't be parallel to each other because it's not the same uh, angle they are not they not they didn't enter at the same angle so make sure you don't draw them parallel to each other if it was the entering angle the incidence angle for both was the same then the refracted angle would be the same but they must diverge a bit since this one has more incidence angle then it should experience more refraction and then we need to extend them so we'll extend this ray just make sure it's exactly on it extension um, and next we'll extend the other ray let me just make sure it's on it so this is the extended ray and you can see they are meeting at point this is the point they intersect with so this should be the image they label it as j and that's it now in those two examples we didn't do any calculation just approximate drawing so in this example we have to do it and from here we want to first find the angle of incidence we know definitely the angle of incidence is from the normal line so therefore the angle of incidence is uh, 90 minus 35 which would be 55 degrees so this is the angle of incidence that's the normal line and they said the glass has a refractive index of 1.5 we need to find the angle of refraction now this case it's going from air to glass so we know n equals sine i divided by sine r n is 1.5 sine i which is sine 55 over sine r it should be sine r equals sine 55 divided by 1.5 and r would equal 
sine inverse this whole thing I'm just taking this sine over there because I just want the angle of refraction so it should be sine inverse sine 55 over 1.5 uh, when you when you calculate you do this all at once let me show you how so this is shift sine and then we have sine 55 divided by 1.5 and your answer is 33 the angle should be 33 so that's what we are going to do r is 33 now we take our protractor and this angle should be 33 exactly 33 and then we draw the ray up to this point all right now when it exits of course we should draw another normal line 90 degrees to the surface and from there since it entered with an angle of 55 since the glass is a parallel parallel sided glass prism then definitely it should also exit with an angle of 55 definitely don't forget to draw the directions now next thing figure 7.1 shows a ray of light traveling in air incident on a glass prism so this is an example that would involve uh, total internal reflection the refractive index is 1.5 it's given draw the continuation of the light ray until it emerges away from the prism so at this point at this entrance point we know it came perpendicular to the surface or exactly on the normal line which means the angle of incidence is zero therefore it's going to continue straight from this point it will definitely continue straight and at this point we need to draw the normal line let's just make sure it's straight yeah so from here the normal line is should be 90 degrees to the surface so this is the path of the normal line i'm going to now since this is 60 then this is 30 since this whole thing is 90 then definitely this angle is 60 so the angle of incidence is 60 we don't know whether this angle is going to uh, reflect totally internally reflect or it's going to refract and how can we find that by comparing it with the critical angle of the medium so let's first find the critical angle by the way don't forget to draw the direction so let's let's figure out the critical angle since the refractive index is 1.5 we know that sine c equals 1 over n which is in this case 1.5 so c should equal sine inverse 1 over 1.5 when you calculate especially with sine inverse you calculate all at once do not split your calculation into multiple steps just do it all at once so that you don't have to deal with the rounding problems as we said this is the last thing shift sign 1 over 1.5 to the close the answer 41.8 so about 42 the critical angle is about 42 degrees now since it's 42 degrees the angle of incidence is 60 so the angle of incidence is more than the critical because 60 is more than 42 this answer c was 42 therefore total internal reflection would happen so definitely we come from here and we have an angle of 60 so 10 20 30 40 50 60 this should be the path of the reflected ray and that's what we are going to do that's the new direction this angle was also 60 degrees so now at this point still we don't know maybe it should it would uh, internally reflect or it would continue to refract we don't know yet but we can know draw the normal line and first of all we need to find this angle so let me i'll extend the normal just to show you how we can find it so since this is 30 definitely this should be 60 degrees and since this is 60 definitely this is 120 because it's a straight line and this is also 30 because the whole thing should be 90 this is already 60 so this is 30 so what's left this is a triangle 30 plus 120 150 so we also have here another 30 now this is the angle of incidence which is this time the angle of incidence is less than the critical 30 is less than 42 so refraction would occur and how much refraction well we need to find out this is now going from glass to air so we're going to use 1 over n equals sine i over sine r so 1 over 1.5 equals sine the i which is 30 and divided by sine r the angle that we want to find so from here we can know making this as the subject cross multiplication uh, sine r equals 1.5 equals 1.5 times sine 30 and r would equal sine inverse 1.5 times sine 30 so let's go and calculate sine inverse 1.5 times sine 30 and your answer is 48.59 so we can say 49 take this and 
make sure the angle is 49 so 10 20 30 40 and 49 should be up to this point yeah and then we draw refracted ray all right so that's it next we have total internal reflection in an optic fiber and this is just you have to do it for several times so here you draw the normal line you can do it you can do it roughly quickly in this one because as long as you know the the whole idea of it take your compass uh, sorry the protractor so this is over here you can see the number 166 so we go to the other side same thing 166 this should be the path of the uh, reflected ray and that's what we are going to do i'm going to use blue until it reaches the other surface exactly on the line until it reaches the other surface and then from there we also draw another normal line and from there same thing so this is at about 160 about 168 so we come over here all right we draw it until it touches the surface again and from this point draw the normal line it would have been better if we used the protractor to check if this angle is 90. so finally this is about 163 we do the same and we draw the line total internal reflection until it exits and don't forget to label the directions yes. all right so next on our list so how to deal with lenses now it says a vertical object that is one centimeter all is to be positioned to the right of the lens with one end on the principal axis one end of it should be on the principal axis draw the object in a position that will produce a real enlarged image so this case should be between f1 and 2f1 so if this is f1 2f1 should, should be somewhere around here if you don't know what's this case search the channel you will find a video that explains lenses and all the other topics actually label this object q and then we place an object that is one centimeter tall so we need our ruler flip it vertically so from here we draw i'm going to use blue this is the object one centimeter tall Okay, but make sure it's vertical now this is an arrow so let's make it an arrow one side on the principal axis draw two rays showing how the real image is formed all right so draw any two of the standard rays now the first standard ray is that if it goes parallel to the principal axis which is about here and then after that it should pass through the focal point so it should pass through the focal point on the other side and that's one of the first standard rays and the other one says that if it passes through the center then it should continue through the center so this is our second standard ray you see they intersect at this point so I'm label the point of intersection and that's where your image is this is the image of this object of course it's pointing down it's in reverse now this is enlarged you can see it's, it's larger in size we should label it with the letter i so this is i the image this was the object o and we should we can actually uh, calculate the magnification so this was one centimeter one centimeter when we, when we go over here this is about 1.9 centimeter so the magnification in this case is 1.9 1.9 divided by 1 you get 1.9 that's the ratio of magnification so this is it let's look at another question an object is placed in front of a converging lens a real image is formed as shown the converging lens is not shown so they gave us the object and they gave us the image now definitely we know if we connected the standard rays so if we had one from the top directly to the top of the image then definitely definitely it should pass this point on the principal is the center point let me label it this is the center point of the lens because so this is the standard ray when it passes through the center then it should continue straight now so from the center point that's the first thing we draw the center line of the lens you don't have to draw the lens you just need to draw the center line of the lens and then from there we can draw the other another ray one of the standard rays so if this ray is parallel to this then after from the image it should pass through the focal point so definitely this point this point over here should be this point should be the focal point and make sure you label the direction of light rays and this one is focal point f and then they want a third possible ray from a to b so another one would be the opposite so the third standard ray from here and then should be from this point to this point then definitely this point must be f on the other side of the lens and that's it another question about the rays 
here they said an object that is 2 cm high is placed 2 cm to the left of the lens so we need our ruler 2 cm to the left of the lens so let's label this point then 2 cm high exactly vertical and we draw a line 2 cm high so this is our object I'm going to represent it as an arrow and then the focal length is 3 cm so let me label it so after 3 cm this should be the focal point now the object is between the focal point between the focal point and the center of the lens therefore you should get a virtual image now let's do two of the standard rays if one ray goes from here and then the other one passing through now we need to extend those rays let me draw the direction of the rays so let's extend those rays to extend them I'll use another color same goes from here okay this was short let me elongate this I'm going to erase this one and that's intersection point so we are going to label it and from there this is the image now definitely this is a virtual image so for the eye in order for the eye to view this image well the eye must be in this position now you don't need a screen it's unlike the previous cases where you needed a screen because they were real images all right and then you need to find the distance of the image to the lens so measure this distance and the height of the image so you can see the distance is 10.5 the height is about 9.5 yeah, 9.7 all right so that's it last thing is just to practice how to do the graphs so here you have the uh, background count rate in a lab is 30 counts per minute a radioactive sample has a half-life of 50 minutes the sample is placed at a fixed distance from a detector so let me draw the scenario we have a sample radioactive emits radiation and then you have a detector and the sample is just radiating in all directions radiation hits the detector the detector records now remember the detector records the radiation coming from the source itself and the background radiation let me represent background radiation with this color there is also some background radiation the source emits a lot of radiation but on the background there is some some of it going towards towards the uh, detector also and they already gave you the background is 30 and the sample is 310 they want us to draw the graph of count rate from the sample corrected for background radiation so how can we do that all right so the first thing was 310 so 310 minus the 30 and then you get 280 so from 280 this is 290 this is the 280 over here this is our starting point let me label the points okay make sure you are able to read the scale and then after 50 minutes so let's use lines after 50 minutes which is exactly the half here 40 to 50 minutes okay so after 50 minutes it should be half of that so what is half of 280 280 divided by 2 you get 140 so let's label where is the 140 10 20 30 40 so this is the point from here let me extend it and that's that's our point okay you can instead of you know instead of the lines so that we are not bothered with raising them later yeah we can just use the ruler place it in a vertical position that's the 50 now 140 as we said this is 10 20 30 40 and yeah, this point so from here it was 140 goes again it becomes 70 so where is 70 this is 100 so this is 90 80 70 after a time off when it becomes 100 so this is it we follow this path until it's 100 and then after another 50 which is 150 again it's half of 70 everything we divided by 2 divided by 2 we get 35 we'll start from here this is 10 20 35 about somewhere in here and then we simply connect trying to smoothly connect the points you can adjust in here and then erase try to make it as smooth as possible that's it thank you so much that was the last question i hope this was beneficial for you don't forget to like subscribe and share